Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out tonight to the Ethics of Jesus. This is being hosted by the Secular Student Alliance. Uh, we have a meeting tomorrow, Thursday, at uh, 12 o'clock in Form 2. We also have our sign-up sheet, so you can be on our emailing list if you'd like. Uh, it'll be being passed around uh, during the beginning of this lecture. Uh, the lecturer tonight will be Dr. Brian Atra. He is an ethics and world religion teacher here at USI. He holds six degrees, three undergraduate, two masters, and a PhD. His doctoral dissertation was on the uh, Greek uh, New Testament. Uh, he has been teaching in colleges and university classes since the mid-1980s. He, he served as president of two affiliated colleges, uh, Rock River Christian College in Wisconsin and Atlantic Bible School in Georgia. Uh, for 31 years, Dr. Atra has served as the Unitarian uh, Congregation and currently speaks weekly in both El Dorado, Illinois and Frederickstown, Missouri. Uh, his academic interests include ethics, religion, philosophy, history, and uh, language. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Brian Ashwell. Go ahead, Frank. So now we can get rid of what's up here and not distract us. If so, we can take it away. If no one wants to uh, get it, Dr. Mann, you can do that quick. Well, and thank you. Uh, while he does it, that'll give us a chance to focus a little bit quick. Uh, quickly on what I've written on the board. Uh, <clears throat> I did a relatively similar presentation at 11 this morning, although we had far fewer people enrolled uh, attending, probably at what, three times the attendance of this evening. So, thank you. Uh, there were considerable and very valuable questions, so I'm going to anticipate lecturing sufficiently to cover an outline that I have here, but we'll have plenty of questions. The nature of my lecturing is that there may be times when right in the lecture you absolutely have to have a question answered, and if you'll raise your hand at the most natural breaking point, I will get to that. But otherwise, uh, after I've gotten through the points, then we'll open it, and in order of precedence, we'll take lecture-related questions and then perhaps broader questions on things like Jesus, ethics, the New Testament, etc. And a nice, very nice assortment of questions. My own background, and Jake has given a little bit about that, I have been working in, most of it obviously has overlapped, in college and university settings and in principally Unitarian churches for about 30 years, a little over 30 years in the church work, a little under in the university work. But among the prominent courses that I taught were classes on Jesus. And we opted to just call the class Jesus, and then just put a period right after it. If you start to add other things in there, you immediately either offend or detract or isolate or whatever. So this is slightly broader than that. It's the, at least as I see it, it's a survey of the ethics that Jesus taught. It's interesting that more often than not, the name that was applied to him was teacher. Sometimes in the Greek it's didaskalos, where we get the adjective didactic. Sometimes the Aramaic or Hebrew word is preserved and written in Greek letters, rabbi, which also implies teacher. So we're considering him as a teacher of ethics. As a teacher of ethics, I would say that Jesus is above average. But I'd like to say that for our faculty as well. Okay. Uh, I am not going to give you the idea that Jesus is the last word in ethics. I don't think we've heard the last word from anyone, whether it was Aristotle, who was actually before Jesus, uh, or Kant, who came 18 centuries later and uh, frankly had huge differences with Jesus over some of the things I'll talk about. But this is rather a survey approach. Uh, I appreciate the Secular Student Alliance. I serve as sort of an assistant faculty advisor, try to get to most of the meetings, know some of you. And when they asked me to do something maybe about a month ago, 
Uh, to prepare for this, I simply got my Greek New Testament and mostly the English translations and just reread straight through. So the sources for what I'm going to do are primarily the canonical Gospels. Those are the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Though those of us who hold New Testament degrees are virtually certain that they were not written in that order, that Mark is the first, then come probably Matthew and Luke, and then John a bit later. Only indirectly will I touch on the non-canonical materials. There's actually not really as much in there that fits ethics anyway, though they are very fruitful for study. Those are things like the Gospel of Peter, and particularly the Gospel of Thomas, which is undergoing enormous scholarly scrutiny right now. I have identified what I think are three paradigm shifts that I find in the ethics of Jesus. So when you study Jesus, you're studying an itinerant para-professional at best, philosopher, religionist, ethicist, who emerges as a key figure in that fascinating era of history, the first century of the Common Era. Most of you have learned, if you have been in some of my classes, you've learned that we've pretty well done away with the abbreviations of <clears throat> B.C. and A.D. because they are loaded in terms of, uh, each of them has a sort of Christian slant to it. B.C., before Christ, Anno Domini, Latin year of our Lord. Each of them has a confessional nature to it. So now we generally do B.C.E. and C.E. And the first century C.E. is a, is a fascinating century for history, for language, philosophy, religion, and clearly in the first century uh, and the early part of the first century, the most interesting person who emerges is Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, I will generally not use the term Christ because that too is a very loaded term. I don't mind if you, when you ask a question, use that kind of term. I'll just limit it to Jesus. That, that if we talk in terms of just saying Jesus, I'm referring then to the central figure in those four Gospels and a series of other literature that later develops. In uh, Harrisburg, about two miles from the great village of Muddy, where I am the second most important resident of the 90 people who live there, I saw a fabulous bumper sticker about three or four months ago, beginning of the semester, maybe around August. Just a plain black and yellow bumper sticker that, and it was on a rather ordinary car. And it said, just very simply, Jesus was a liberal Jew. I find that fascinating because today, the majority of people who claim this sort of superior connection to Jesus or higher level of allegiance to him probably fail to recognize his Jewishness and fail to recognize what a liberal, in fact, he was. That the bumper sticker says it quite well and sort of sets us up for the lecture. In these three paradigm shifts that I'm going to identify in his ethics, we understand that he comes from a Jewish background. By coming from a Jewish background, that would include things like certainly monotheism, messianic expectation, a certain degree of legalism, and yet he emerges as a very liberal and liberating figure. So there are, as I see it, a series of paradigm shifts. The points on the right-hand side are really the greater details of the third point on the left. But the three paradigm shifts that you find when you go from, say, traditional Judaism, the Mosaic Code, the days of the Old Testament prophets, or Hebrew Bible would probably be a better term to use, till you get to Jesus, the three paradigm shifts emerge. The first one is that Jesus' ethic moves from something external to something internal. I am by no means the first scholar of biblical studies to sort of appreciate Jeremiah chapter 31 as the high water mark of the Hebrew Bible. I think it is. In Jeremiah 31, the verses are 31 through 34, the prophet Jeremiah, some 600 years before the time of Jesus, predicts a day that will come. He doesn't say when, but he predicts a day that will come when spiritual instruction will no longer be written on stony tablets, but upon the heart of people. And Jesus, who obviously studied Isaiah and 
probably studied Jeremiah, who would have been probably considered the second of those great prophets, may very well have read Jeremiah, and either he was inspired to sort of produce that kind of an ethic, or he interpreted himself, he interpreted himself as the fulfillment of that. that. Or, at the very least, maybe his early followers sort of hung this on him. There's a chicken and egg cycle there, and, and scholars never reach unanimity on this, but <clears throat> there are constant questions about how much was original to Jesus versus how much did people credit him for. You're stuck in a problem either way because there is some undisputed genius there. And it almost makes sense to believe at least a fair amount of it came from Jesus himself who was seen as this wonderfully and capable and gifted inspired interpreter. It's in a way a tall order to sort of put that all on one person. But on the other hand, the, the people who followed him were men of most ordinary means. My own doctoral dissertation was written on the text of the Greek New Testament comparing the speaking of Peter in the book of Acts and the speaking of Peter in the first epistle of Peter. And in Acts 4.13, there are two of Jesus' closest followers there, John and Peter. And they are described in the Greek text as being ignorant and unlearned. Agramatos, the Greek word, unlettered. And ignorant, as in not knowing. So, while it's a tall order to sort of credit a lot of this to Jesus, it's an even more difficult position to say, well, a bunch of his followers got together and these guys even outsmarted him. Therefore, I think at the very least, a certain amount of this goes back to Jesus himself. And scholars may argue whether it's 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. We can take that up at some other point. But clearly, the first big paradigm shift is that Jesus represents an ethic that moves from the external to the internal. And I think it's to his credit in this regard. Ethics should not be a, a dry and detached and sort of stilted thing where you go and you find tablets or parchments or books, you know, many thousands of pages in length and look something up. And yet that was sort of the tradition that had developed in the rabbinic setting of Jesus himself. Um, if you've studied the Talmud, that's exactly the way, the way in which the Talmud is constructed. You have the text from the Hebrew Bible and you have surrounding layers of commentary and interpretation on the text. And when they fill those pages, they go on and on. The Babylonian Talmud is uh, easily larger than the full length of the unabridged Encyclopedia Britannica. And there was the tendency to go, Jesus moves it the other direction toward the internal. So in a very entertaining story, which is told in Mark's Gospel, probably the earliest of the four, there's a time when critics come to Jesus and they file a complaint with him. And there are lots of complaints. In fact, if you read the four Gospels, in all four of them, Jesus is taking complaints from his detractors. But this particular complaint says, Why do your twelve disciples not wash their hands according to the way that the traditions of the elders say your hands should be washed? And it goes on to say, and they don't wash copper pots and hams the right way, and Jesus does not get into a diatribe over which way a copper pot or pan should be washed. He says, you should understand that it is nothing that goes into the person that defiles the person. It's what comes out from the person that defiles the person. The King James Bible, which is still the most widely used and revered in America, says man, anthropos in Greek, almost always includes both genders. There are separate words for man is male. On air or andros, it's anthropos there. I've said person. It might flow better if you would read it. Jesus said it's not what goes into a man or a woman that defiles a man or a woman. It's what comes out of a man or a woman that defiles a woman. So the external ethic is done away with in Jesus. It gets more specific in Matthew, which is almost certainly a slightly later gospel, when Jesus, and here in Matthew, the 
most fertile area for the ethical teaching is 5, 6, and 7 in what is often called the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it's the part of...